Good afternoon. We're starting a, a discussion about clove fouling. In other words, it's an IMO project about invasive species. Just to uh, inform you, invasive species is uh, coming from uh, fouling on ships. In this case, we're talking about uh, the marine industry. And invasive species are the main cause of the loss of biodiversity. The loss of biodiversity is equal to climate change and is one of the causes of climate change. According to the UN, who had in April in Paris a special meeting on the, the loss of biodiversity and invasive species, they're saying invasive species are the silent killer. Nobody knows it, nobody hears it, but it's just starting and it's killing the biodiversity of the world. So for that particular reasons, the UN and IMO started an special project, what they called clove fouling. And clove fouling is with an aim how to fight and how to reduce invasive species. And it doesn't matter whether it's an, uh, an coating system, it doesn't matter it's another system, it's about fighting against invasive species. That's the real topic. Um, my opinion is not important. I can tell you I'm the environmental consultant of uh, ICOMIA. I'm working with ICOMIA since uh, 1988, so a long time. Uh, one of the founders of the environmental committee within ICOMIA. And I can tell you from day one, when I started in this business, I had anti-fouling and clove fouling on my desk, together with dredging and together with environmental systems. So. I'd like to introduce everybody, and I think everybody is capable to introduce themselves. Uh, hello, yes, uh, I'm Dominic Finlow. I'm the technical director of NRG Marine. Uh, over the last 11 years, we've been developing and selling the world's leading uh, ultrasonic antifoul system, the uh, Sony Hull. Uh, biodiversity is a, a major issue, but also the environmental changes with the biocide-free era that we're fast coming into. So this is something we've been looking at very closely. Uh, I think the reason I've got this microphone first is uh, I'm probably the n only non-PhD here. I'm just an engineering techno nerd, so uh, they made me go first. But, uh, <laughs> that's me. Thank you. Uh, my name's Gareth Prowse. I'm here as a representative of the World Coatings Council anti fouling Coating Committee. Uh, I am, uh, unfortunately, a PhD. Uh, but uh, I have a background in marine biology, and I've spent the past 15 years doing environmental risk assessment for anti-foulings and handling regulatory issues around uh, those products and how we can use them in a safe way uh, for the benefit of preventing invasive species and protecting vessels from fouling. Uh, I should also say that I work for Hempel Coatings, so uh, I have uh, full disclosure. So Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Redding, Head of Sustainability for World Sailing. Um, World Sailing is the International Federation for the Sport. So we have uh, member national authorities in 145 countries, uh, as well as 115 classes of boat and sanctioned special events such as America's Cup, uh, the Ocean Race, and so forth. Um, we're a strategic partner in the IMO's Glow Fouling Project, um, and really uh, happy to be here to take questions on that. Hello, I am uh, Manon Vermeer from uh Dutch Recreational Waterways Foundation. Um, we are, I'm sustainability manager, and um, we are responsible for uh, a help desk, which uh, consult, uh, advises consumers about the regulations or around anti-fouling. And um, we are also uh, promoting the alternatives which are existing now. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Hans Slechtenhorst. I'm the, the global marketing manager for Action Nobel, uh, better known under the brands International and Allgrip. And in, under the Allgrip brand, uh, we're a market leader in, in supplying anti-fouling in, uh, in this market. And obviously for us, it's very important uh, to see where we have to go, where everybody's going, to align our products uh, to, the, to the future. And uh, uh, to uh, also look into the environment, but also look into the invasive species. And they're both challenges, so uh, yeah. 
Hello, I'm uh, Rick Breur. I'm a uh, managing director of uh, Finsulate. Uh, Finsulate is a company that produces uh, anti filing wraps, uh, which uh, prevent filing in an environmental friendly way with a physical barrier. Uh, we're not part of the Glow Fouling Consortium, but uh, merely here as a, as a producer of one of the alternatives to, uh, to the toxic anti filing paints. Okay, so we're now. Uh all the players are introduced. Um, before I continue, after this uh, session, when somebody has special questions and not uh, able to, uh, to point them out before, there's in the corner at the innovation lab at the other side uh, for at least uh, roughly an, uh, half an hour time to uh, approach everybody separately and to start discussions for your own or whatsoever. So we have a uh, special area uh, available for uh, the next half an hour, over the half an hour after the, the forum. Yeah. Um, to open the discussion, I have uh, prepared, uh, let's say, two que main questions. Uh, it's about um, invasive species, and it's about, let's say, to fight invasive species. And one of the products that in the past was using is anti-fouling, and now in these days we have a lot of alternatives. The main question is, what is biocidal free? And I'd like to have, uh, let's say, the opinion from all the members here on the panel, their own opinion. You're starting? Uh, I got the microphone, so <laughs> I, can, I can start. Uh, yeah, biocidal free for me, that's, uh, that means that there's no uh, biocidal compounds in, uh, in a product which are coming out. Uh, so uh, no matter why uh, you use uh, compounds in a, in a, in a product, if something leaches out of it, uh, to my sense, even if you don't call it the biocide, it's still a biocide. I mean, that's why there's regulations uh, for all kind of consumer products, um, and why there's threshold values of, of certain products, uh, certain chemical compounds into products. So for me, biocide-free means that there's nothing leaching out of a paint or uh, any product. That's an interesting challenge, nothing leaching out of a paint, because always you have something coming out. but. Yeah, um, for me, biocidal uh, uh, free is pretty similar to what you say. So no active ingredients, no active biocidal ingre ingredients coming out of the paint uh, uh, with a purpose to kill or destroy or whatever is on, on, uh, coming on the, on the ship or on the vessel. So for me, that's a description of biocide free. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the biocidal products we know now, but it could also be some, some future products as well. So, uh, so I'm basically agreeing with what you're saying, but... I uh, can only say that I, got, I get a lot of questions about bios, biocidal free uh, paint or coatings that way from uh, consumers. And they are all a bit conspicuous about it. They don't really trust um, the companies which they buy their products from. It would be good when, uh, if we would have uh, some kind of uh, proof about that for them. Because some I see that more and more consumers really want to have this environmental friendly product that has really changed over the years. Uh, I think I agree with what everyone said really. I mean, it's just, uh, it, if, if you have defined biocides, if they're leaching into the environment, um, something that biocide, that's defined as biocide free is something that doesn't do that. I think it's as simple as that, or, or is it? Okay, so uh, I have to agree with the previous comments, but where I do disagree is the, the point about zero release. Okay, so a biocide is an intended ingredient that's in the, the product to control, deter, or destroy a target organism. It's a very precise definition from a regulatory perspective. And to say that a zero, you have to have zero release, that anything that comes out could be a biocide is simply not true. And you need to be quite careful with statements like that because coatings that are, or films and wraps, I'm pretty sure that if you do the right study, you will find leachates of substances from those systems as well. So the clear distinction is that they're intended to control or deter or destroy the organism that you're looking to affect. That's not to say that other compounds that could come out of a film or a coating could have a deleterious effect on the environment, but they're definitely not biocidal. So there you go. Well, I'm going to have to change the line here a little bit. Uh, I don't want to sound like an advert, but um, ultrasonics is biocide free. We just emit sound waves which target the algae, the weed, the slime. Uh, so 
our admissions are purely ultrasonic sound, so um, Sonny Hull is biocide free, but uh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, may maybe just uh, can you explain uh, when you're talking about ultrasonic? Um, these days, uh, we have an, uh, a new legislation international coming up on the, on the water noise. And one sorry, of. I can't hear you properly. Sorry. The new legislation in relation to ultrasonore is also uh, has a relation to the underwater noise. It, do you have any measurements about that? Yes, we've done quite a few. In fact, we had to, um, in uh, British Columbia, for British Columbia ferries, we had to prove that we were not going to in interfere with the breeding cycle of orca killer whales. Now, to be honest, if a killer whale wants to get it on, I'm not getting in its way. But, um, yeah, we have all sorts of environmental tests to prove that we're not harmful to uh, marine life as such. We're only affecting the, uh, the microcellular construction of algae and bacteria. Uh, we're also creating a movement of water on the surface, which stops the barnacle larvae and others from embedding in the first place. But uh, we have no signals which are considered predatory to any of the marine species either, so we're not uh, environmentally affecting them either. Okay. Good. I have another question, and in fact it's uh, two questions. Um, when do you expect biocidal free, in this case, coatings, and are they able to fight the invasive species? Of course, that's the real aim, what we have. And I know, of course, ultrasonor is not in, in coatings, but sometimes you are w working with coatings. So, uh, well, I would say that uh, for hull coatings, we would still always recommend a good hull coating because it's a very harsh environment down there. So, yeah. uh, belt and braces is always the best uh, way forward. But uh, I think PhDs might know a bit more yeah. than me on this subject. You don't need a PhD for this. <laughs> so, biocide free products are available right now. So you, you can go and buy a biocide free coating for a container ship, for a tugboat, for a yacht, for a super yacht, uh, right now from the majority of the major paint makers uh, immediately. So if you go around to Hempel stand or international stand or Yoten stand, you'll be able to find out about biocide or free solutions. So whether they're silicone or hard products that need lots of cleaning, there, there are plenty of options out there right now. And do they control inv invasive species? Absolutely they do. The products that we sell, we don't sell products that don't work, right? Uh, in some cases, there are limitations on when you can apply to which type of vessel and certain parameters with how the vessel operates, but they work when they're used in the right way. So but I think it's safe to say that because they're unusual in the way that they are, they're applied and some of the limitations on them, that you have to be a bit more careful about what you do with them, but absolutely they work. So it's, uh, the future is here. There are biocide free solutions. It's just we're in a conservative market where getting people to change practice and operate their vessel in a slightly different way or do something different with their yacht. Sometimes there's a bigger cultural change that you have to get over rather than just placing a product on a market for use. Um, I think, uh, as Gareth said, the, the products are available now, but in terms of um, combating invasive species, that's sort of one part of the solution. Um, there's been research that so certainly for dinghy sailing, for example, it's not just, it, it will be um, it, organisms within uh, wet wetsuits and, and the rest of the gear that, that could be transported from one place to the other. So I think antifoul for certainly for bigger boats is a really, really key part of, um, of tackling this issue. But there's many other factors and certainly I think world sailing has a role in informing the stakeholders uh, about those issues. Maybe just an, another question in that respect. Um, it's not only the coating, it's uh, not the anti-fouling or whether ultra sonore, it's also the design of the submerged area of the boat is uh, quite important. Can you tell us uh, something about that as well? I'm not a naval architect either, but right. um, yeah, we have these um, areas called niche, niche areas, yeah. um, and typically they're, they're the ones that are, as the name suggests, sort of difficult to, to get. So in terms of um, shipping, um, they're, they're typically the areas such as um, cooling areas and inlets where um, you'll have organisms that will um, be difficult to, to eradicate. Um, so they're, they're the areas that need particular attention. And normally when we're looking at um, recreational boating as a vector, um, they're the sort of t typically they're the areas that need to be addressed. 
All I can say is that we have tested a lot of alternatives this last season, and uh, a few of the producers are here too. And, uh, well, we have some uh, remarkable uh, results, but uh, I'm not allowed to, to, to tell something about that yet. But uh, the results will be available in, uh, in January. Yeah, I cannot say anything different than Garrett already said. Uh, there are alternatives available. Um, uh, there are good alternatives, uh, alternatives available. There are less good alternatives available. It's all depending on what you want, how much you want to pay for it, and what your expectations are. And it's very much depending on where your boat is and where you're sailing. Um, uh, so you have to think about the, 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 the product you choose for the area you're in. Um, but also, we are uh, again, we're in a very conservative market. Uh, you mentioned there's a growing attention on the, under the owners, but it's only recently starting to, to grow. Uh, we also see within uh, in Superyacht, uh, uh, two weeks ago I was in Fort Lauderdale. We also heard there from a Superyacht perspective that owners are more looking into sustainable solutions. So there's slowly a mindset that there's a change there. But also, there needs to be a change in the yards, in the application uh, of the products, because uh, they are different. And, uh, and uh, there are some, are, some are, for instance, silicon containing, and silicon and paint, that's swearing in church. So, so you don't want them together. So there needs to be a change in the way the, 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 the yards are working with these products, uh, the way the boats are hauled out of the water, because uh, the, the, our silicon products are pretty slippery. That's why they don't go foul grow fouling but also when you pull them out, they can be slippery. So there, there are some other changes to be made in the complete industry uh, to make this work uh, everywhere. But again, the products are there. No, I agree that the, the products are there. I think that's, uh, like you say, there's, uh, there should be also a change in mindset, not just from the shipyards, but also from the, from the consumers. Um, What's important is to realize that if you don't want to use any chemicals, any toxins, um, you have to realize that some cleaning will be necessary. And especially if you want to prevent invasive species, you cannot rely on any product. I, I don't believe there's any product that has no fouling on it uh, in time. Um, so you have to, if you go from one area to the other, you have to realize that and make sure that you do some cleaning before. That's, that's the only way to prevent inv invasive species because there will always be some, uh, some there. And that, uh, I've been uh, last year was on holiday in the U.S. And if you go there to the lakes, um, you take your boat out of the water, you get a sticker. You get the the muscle uh, the muscle control sticker. And so uh, people go from one lake to the other. They just have to prove uh, that their boat has been checked, their boat has been cleaned. And I think if you really want to prevent invasive species, you have to go to a system like that because there's always going to be a barnacle somewhere. There's always going to be a species somewhere. Uh, on the boat that has not been, uh, that, that has found a way to, uh, to stick. Okay. In the audience, do you know how many uh, invasive species are in Europe for the last decade? Do you have any guess? I can tell you there were 20,000 species, whereby 14,000 invasive species. So species means that they belong in that particular area and non-native species or invasive species are not belonging in that area. 14,000 in 10 years. And if you go to the US, you will find them 50,000. And if you go to Australia and New Zealand, they made, let's say, a more detailed uh, survey. We set up an, a fact sheet within ICOMIA, how many species are there, where they are coming from, and what are, let's say, the worst for, for, let's say, the industry, but also for the biodiversity and the loss of biodiversity. Coming in that respect, um, uh, I call of, uh, sorry, uh, I meant I most started with the Clove Fouling Project, and the Clove Fouling Project is really fighting the invasive species. That means that we have to give attention to all kinds of items. Uh, like we had an, in, the, in the past many discussions about recycling, it's the same with anti-fouling. We have to start with the design of a boat. Of course, like uh, Dan was saying already, the design of the submerged area of the boat is quite important to, let's say, to prevent invasive species. And then you have easy other systems to, to, uh, to fight them. Um, what I'm missing in the whole discussion up to now is, uh, although Hans mentioned it already, when you're getting a, let's say, a boat out of the water, 
and it's uh, slippery, but besides slippery, there's some fouling around it, always. And I, uh, I acknowledge it. We started, let's say, in some parts of, uh, of the world with uh, w wastewater treatments. What is your op opinion about wastewater treatments after cleaning the hulls? And what kind of systems do you think are more or less the best? Because mostly they have to be implemented at the marinas. And the marinas are suffering, let's say, with a lot of investments in relation to uh, waste management, in relation to wastewater, in relation to uh, energy. So there's a lot of coming up. Well, I can't, can't comment too much uh, because I got no experience with it. But um, from an invasive species perspective, I would think that if you clean your boat before going on a long tour, uh, you would prevent the invasive species uh, to spread. So I would say, well, uh, do the cleaning before you go and not uh, do the cleaning when you uh, arrive at, uh, at your destination. Uh. Yeah, let's say according to the Australians, that is the best solution. But how to treat the wastewater coming off? Because they are, they are Garrett wants to answer it. Yeah, I don't know. The, uh, I, I got no... Uh, you want it? Yeah, yeah, I'll should I could. I can make one comment or two comments. Yeah, so um, wastewater treatment is already happening in, in yeah. some countries. I know it's happening in Holland, for instance. I was in, 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 in America on some yards where they also do that. So the boats come out when they spray them off. All the wastewater is collect, uh, collected, goes through filtered before it goes back. And then uh, the residue is being uh, treated as chemical, uh, chemical disposal. But um, uh, I think that has to be enforced because uh, 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 we're leaching out products uh, when they're sailing, but when you're spraying them off, you leach out maybe even more product uh, and your invasive species and everything else that's on it. So you don't want that to, to end up in the water again. Uh, I think that, uh, that or, uh, already a big win will be if all the, all the uh, residue coming from the, from the cleaning is collected. Uh, you already have a big, uh, big win on, uh, on, getting, on getting materials into, into the water. I can make a comment for the Netherlands. I know that all the wastewater is treated, uh, which come from spraying off, and uh, it goes into the sewage system, so it doesn't go back into the surface water. If you would like to say something. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've probably done about 300 um, audits of different marinas, environmental audits, and seen a range of um, uh, washdown systems, sometimes closed loop, sometimes nothing at all. Um, I think one of the challenges is that there doesn't seem to be a kind of a unit, a one-size-fits-all unit, um, certainly um, from uh, the different countries that I visited. Um, secondly, uh, some, some marinas will have uh, a system with different like flocculation, looking at different parts of the, some will take, um, try to uh, eliminate the biofouling, um, keep that, some will identify the heavy metals and, and other sort of components. And almost each uh, additional um, uh, part of the wastewater that you want to, to filter, there's an additional cost. So you see some systems that kind of have all of the, uh, the elements where it will be um, filtered about five, six different times, but we're talking sort of 40, 40,000 euro system. Um, and then some of which will recirculate the water, some of which will discharge to the foul um, sewage system, um, some of which discharge back into the marine marina basin with an environmental permit. So there's lots of different ways that, um, or sometimes without a permit, but uh, there's lots of different ways that it can be approached, but I think there's a definite need for a consistent system, and that's something which um, I suppose is a challenge to the industry to, to develop. Okay, so I think it's important to make a distinction in when you, you talk about cleaning. So what you're just describing now about pier side, lifting the boat out of the water and washing it down, after it's been in the water for a year or so on, that's what I would call corrective action, okay? Uh, but to come back to the first point about certain coatings or certain products needing to be cleaned whilst in water, some of the solutions that have been put forward as biocide free are systems that are designed to be cleaned before it leaves the dock, uh, before it leaves the port. So there's no biocidal effect. You're relying on the cleaning to take off the fouling. So when it comes down to that in-water cleaning, which is becoming more and more prevalent with very large tankers and things like that, uh, and it's, it's likely that you may start to see things coming through with super yachts and so on that you can't lift easily, uh, that then you need to start talking about filtration at the point of cleaning. So if you're going to use a cart system that's cleaning over the surface of the underwater hull, then you need to start looking at what the filtration needs to be. 
So there, there are currently different project groups that are looking at that with cleaning companies to figure out what, what, what level you need to go down to. The New Zealand authorities and the Australian authorities have probably done the biggest studies on this work and their suggestion is that you're, you need to filter down to around 10 to 12 microns in diameter. So you really are trying to filter out dead or potentially living spores or small uh, bacteria and so on that are in the water column during the cleaning. Uh, so it, it's also important to bear in mind that cleaning is being seen as a solution quite often for uh, correcting a, a coating that's gone wrong or whatever, or they're talking about grooming now where you do regular grooming of a coating. Uh, some ports don't allow you to clean, so you can't always do that. So there's a, there's a good example in New Zealand where a vessel was refused entry. Uh, they, wouldn't, they don't do cleaning in New Zealand, it's not allowed, and that vessel had to sail somewhere else to find a clean. It went to Fiji and said, we'd like to clean in your waters, and Fiji said, well, why is that? Oh, because New Zealand wouldn't let us in, and they said, well, if New Zealand didn't let you in, then you're not coming in, go somewhere else. So, so cleaning isn't necessarily a solution all the time. From a coatings manufacturer perspective, uh, I think uh, what, what we see is if you buy the right coating and you specify properly, you shouldn't need to clean, it's a, it's a corrective action. Okay, you shouldn't need to clean, it's a corrective action, okay? So the fact that it goes on in the industry is because either people aren't buying the right coating or they're not being transparent about what they're doing so we don't get the feedback loop to improve the product, right? That's not to say it's a solution in some cases. So like I said, there are coatings out there that work hand in hand with cleaning, but you need to be really careful how you go about that and how you do it because you could be part of the problem. So if you've come in from overseas and then you clean in water before you leave, you could be releasing a non-indigenous species that goes on to become invasive. So I think that there's no silver bullets in this, right? So whole coatings work very well, anti-fouling's work very well, but the point of a glow fouling project is the niche areas. So these are hard to reach areas, the parts where the rudders connect to the main superstructure of the vessel or sea grates and things like that. And there, are, there are similar areas on yachts that have the same issue. These are hard to coat or they don't get the same amount of coat. They will be very difficult to apply a film Right? They might be quite complicated to apply an ultrasound. Right? So in terms of treating niche areas, right, then it's more likely that you're going to have a sort of holistic approach where you have a combination of things to control total fouling. Uh, so uh, for my perspective, cleaning, different solutions, a coating solution, an ultrasound, there's plenty of space in the market for it. But solving the niche area issue is going to be an interesting one going forward. So uh, because that's the sound what I... Uh picked up in Genoa. We had in Genoa also an, uh, a kind of uh, close founding meeting and everybody was asking about the combination of, uh, let's say, solutions. That's to the audience, that was the, the best option they told me. But coming back to wastewater, um, I know that uh, when we started it in the Netherlands uh, and I was involved, uh, we monitored all the wastewater systems and uh, the treatment. We had sedimentation systems and with recirculation systems, etc. And every year, the, the marina or the shipyard has to monitor what, what kind of uh, pollution uh, came off. Is that still the case? Is that still done? Yeah? Because that's giving, let's say, more or less the information whether the system is okay, yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay. We still need to, uh, to check it, yes and they are not allowed to, to let the water wash off into the surface water. And even if they do work, they have to work with screens to prevent uh, the small particles to blow uh, to other... Uh, yes, so they, sh they should. Yeah, okay. But uh, I, I also heard that uh, some uh, companies don't uh, follow the rules really well, so... And what is, to your opinion, let's say, the best way to inform the industry to take actions like we are saying now, wastewater treatment? Well, now, it, it's mainly done for the small particles of copper to prevent the copper from blowing into the water. And they should shift the focus to, uh, to the invasive species or the non-native species. They don't know. Very often, people just are not aware of what they are doing in, at the marinas. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, coming back, let's say, to, to um, the invasive species itself. Um, is there any measurements about, uh, let's say, you tell, tell the audience that there is no uh, data available from invasive species from wastewater treatment? Is that the case? 
No, I don't think they're not in Holland. Okay. Maybe at some particular points they have measured, but I'm, I, uh, I have never heard of that because it is washed off into the sewage system. So, and sewage is treated anyway. So there is no need to know for now. No. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? It's so silence here. Yeah, I, s I heard you mention invasive species several times. I wonder if you could clarify the difference between invasive species and exotic species, as there's a, a bit of a clarification needed there, I would think. So uh, the, the key distinction is between non-indigenous and invasive, okay? So, so an exotic or non-indigenous is a, a species that's arrived in a port or harbor, um, which has never been identified in that environment before. So it's, it historically has never been identified. It doesn't live there anymore. There is a distinction between non-indigenous and invasive. So an invasive species is like a non-indigenous species gone bad. So that you then can demonstrate that that species is having an impact on the ecology around it, where it's out-competing other species that naturally live there. So the, there's a huge debate over the, the, the proportion of invasive species that are actually just non-indigenous, and they're just minding their own business and they're fine. Uh, but it, it turns out that when you do get one that converts to in, uh, an invasive species, it's very hard to get rid of it. The eradication of invasive species, particularly in the marine environment, is extremely difficult. Uh, and, and that's why the Glow Fouling Initiative and, and, and initiatives like that are focused on, to some extent, zero fouling risk uh, and trying to prevent any non-indigenous species getting in because you can't afford the risk that it becomes invasive. Any In fact, more? just to elaborate on the invasive species, if you take something as simple as a zebra mussel, you'd think, how can that little mussel do so much damage? But that's an invasive species that's a really good filter feeder. And this is taking all the ecosystem, all the um, plankton and everything else and filtering out all the nutrients. So this is actually killing off the first layer of the food chain. So in, in some rivers and estuaries, it's totally blighted the whole ecosystem because the first link's been removed and nothing else can exist after that. That's it. Any more questions? I, I appreciate that you as a forum say that there is a suitable project for every user. Now, I represent a boat user organization, and one of our biggest problems is that with new legislation coming in, in the various countries, um, my personal statement would be that we now have products that are allowed inside certain countries, but are not effective. And that leads to another sort of invasive species, and that is anti-fouling paint bought in Germany, brought illegally into the Netherlands, because it appears to be better. So my statement to you is that at the current situation, like we are facing it in various European countries, we have products on the market that are not doing the job for the type of boat that sits in the water for typically six months a year and is being used typically 50 days a year because they foul and they grow. I've seen a, a very good example in Sweden, mind you, on the Baltic side, uh, on the, how do you call it, the Finland side of Sweden in the Stockholm area, where a boat club actually bought an in-water cleaning system and agreed with their club members a couple of years ago that anti-fouling paint was out. So they are simply putting epoxy on the bottom of their boats. And when I was visiting their dry storage, I could see that you had a sort of zebra appearance on the underwater side of all their boats because gradually the anti-fouling paint was fading away. They also claim that within a year, the actual fouling growth is in a very limited period. That is when you want to brush your boats. And as far as the spread of invasive species is concerned, I totally agree. You need to clean your boat before you start to move. But what we're having at the moment is with ineffective paints, people are brushing when the water temperature is nice, which is not necessarily at the start of the trip. Who wants to start with the answer? <laughs> I almost can't help myself. <laughs> no one's taking this from me on this one. I think you, you've highlighted a number of issues there, okay? So 
Uh, so one of the things about anti-fouling coatings is that they contain an active ingredient, okay, which if you are exposed to in excessively high concentrations will cause you harm. Okay, so let's make no bones about it. That's how it works. That, that's how it controls the organism. But to get your product on the market, you pass through a risk assessment process to demonstrate that it has no uh, unacceptable risk to the environment and the user, right? Now, depending on what country you happen to live in, that system, historically, has been more or less strict, right? So what we're right in the middle of right now is a, a new piece of legislation, a biocidal product regulation, right, which pushes the reset button and brings every European country up to the same level, the strictest level. So that's the first thing. So what you describe, the differences from country to country, that will change, and you will probably end up with a series of products that you can buy consistently from one country to the next at broadly the same level of performance, acknowledging that some countries have unique environments for which products will be designed, like Germany freshwater, for example, right? So you don't really need a full-strength saltwater product for freshwaters because the fouling challenge is different. To your second point about ineffective products, one of the concerns that the industry has always had is that the way that risk assessments are carried out is done in a very conservative way. Okay, so when you are uncertain about how you decide whether something has a risk, you make it conservative, so you make it fail safe. Right? And one of the ways that authorities do that is to protect the water inside of the marina. So if you think about a marina, a man-made marina with 500 boats in, I don't know, two or 300 meters squared of water, it's designed to prevent water flow in and out because you want to protect the boats. So that means that to refresh the water and clear anti-fouling, biocides and so on and so forth, it's quite a hard environment to pass a risk assessment because you're, you're emitting. But by the same token, it's a bit of a car park, right? So you don't go to a car park when you do your shopping at the weekend and expect to see wild orchids growing in uh, between the, the parking lines and, and lots of other nice flowers. So you shouldn't really expect that a marina that's man-made that has all these boats in it is going to be similar. So there's an argument about environmental protection, about what's more important to protect. Do we want to protect the water inside of a marina, which is a man-made technosphere, or do we want to think about what's going on outside the marina? Now, I make no judgment. There is no easy answer to that. I don't really have a biased opinion. But right now, what we're looking at is the concentration inside the marina. So the products that you'll end up with will be products that pass the risk assessment and are not necessarily designed to perform the best way for that market. However, it is driving the industry to change, and we are seeing that biocide-free products now, the performance that you can see in the biocide-free products and ultrasound and the, the other films and things like that, they are matching the performance of traditional anti-founding coatings. So I think now we're at the point where people are open to boat washes and things like that. You're kind of paving the way for the next generation of products that you need to apply in a different way, you need to think differently about how they use. That opens it up to bring these new products in that have good performance that are non-biocidal if you look after them in the right way. So for me, it's really important for the boat user to start thinking differently about the product and be open-minded to new things and look at the performance rather than just, well, I've always used an anti-fouling and I trust this because it's got 40% copper. So shifting that mindset is very important. Otherwise, these guys will never get in with their ultrasound and stuff like that, right? So do you, you, you must want to comment now. Well, no, actually, I, I totally agree. But one thing maybe hasn't been considered, about 65% of our business is not just for hulls. It's 65% is for all the unseen services, your, your sea chests, your raw water sea handling, your box coolers, things like that. So all the areas where you say you can't paint, this is where we're uh, also coming in. But, uh, but yeah. thanks for your kind words anyway. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, for the ultrasound solution, uh, it's not yet clear to me why you still would need paint on the gel coat. Good question. Well, there is no silver bullet, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, the ultrasound is very good at killing off the algae, the weed, the slime, stopping the barnacles and mussels. But there are some mar marine filter feeders that we struggle with because they're not relying on the algae food chain as such. They're just feeding off of uh, the... Um, plankton and stuff floating by. Now, although barnacles are the same, we're very good at them by stopping them embedding in the first place. But there are some things like keel worm where we, we help, we help to suppress, but we're not the, the perfect answer. So for a hull, we'd always say belt and braces is the best way. A good hard anti-foul 
and ultrasonics will give you a very great result. But for all your pipe work and things like that, ultrasonics is probably your only option, especially after ICAF systems will be eradicated due to the copper ion issues. But uh, yeah, I think purely belt and braces. It's, um OK. Seeing the time, I'd like to ask the, the panel to give you, uh, let's say, one final advice to the audience, your personal advice. Well, it's winter, wear a hat. <laughs> um, well, well, we'll all be over in the lounge afterwards, so if you have any questions, please come over and see us. But uh, I'll, I'll be talking about the Sonny Hole system, which is, has been proven in the last 10 years as one of the most effective biocide-free solutions. So uh, please come over and talk to us. Uh, I think it would be just to be open-minded, right? So there are new technologies out there that in reality aren't actually that new. They may be new to you, but they've been around for a long time. So, so be open-minded and look for the evidence that these products work. Satisfy yourself about performance and not just stick to the thing that's easy to apply and you've always used. So, so be open-minded to the options that are out there. There could be a better solution for you that's biocide-free and even gives you better performance than you currently have. So uh, be prepared to do the research. Um, I think to, uh, to follow the glow fouling project uh, as that develops because I know there's going to be lots of resources that will be developed specifically for end users, for um, the marina infrastructure. Um, and so that's something that's going to be developing in the next year or so. Um, so, yeah, link, link up on the screen, I think. Um, I recommend you all wait for uh, the results of the uh, alternative anti-fouling test and then you can see what suits best for you. Yeah, uh, I can only emphasize what Geras already was mentioning. There are products out there, uh, be open-minded uh, and if you're open-minded and you work with it, uh, be an ambassador uh, because uh, a change needs to be made and a change is in the mindset. And that's usually the most difficult change. The products, different products are not difficult. Changing a mindset of people, that's the challenge we have. Uh, I think I can totally agree. Uh, be open-minded about new things, uh, but also, on the other hand, be realistic. Uh, so um, everyone washes his car uh, a few times a year, at least. Uh, a lot of people do it every Sunday morning. Uh, uh, you wash the deck of your boat uh, once a week, once every two weeks when you're sailing it. So be realistic as well and uh, accept that uh, without uh, biocides, uh, you will need some cleaning uh, on the bottom side of the boat. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, let's say, fi uh, yeah, finalize this uh, forum. One thing I'd like to mention to everybody, this time is the first time since I went uh, into this uh, industry to happen, uh, to have a discussion, an open discussion like this. When we had this discuss, uh, discussion 10 years ago, it was not possible. Uh, whether it was together with the authorities, whether it was together with the industry or the combination of it. So an open mind is starting. And the combination of, uh, let's say, the several solutions is also open to everybody. What I like to point out is that Flow fouling is started this year within IMO. And the, pro, uh, the, the whole process will take four years. So after four years, we have the final solutions, uh, what is possible in this industry. Secondly, I'd like to add also another item. If you, let's say, compare this industry, recreational craft and super yacht industry together with commercial shipping, then I noticed that this is, is much more open-minded than other parts of the industry. If you have any questions to the other side, if you want to have more information or detailed innovation uh, corner at the other side of uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>